Clay County School Board uh, meeting, October 27, 2020. We'll come to order. Uh, I think I'll disperse with the reading because I don't believe there's anyone here except staff and the board. Uh, but if any of you want to say anything, uh, just raise your hand during the meeting. We'll do it. Um, Number one, review draft agenda for regular school board meeting on November 5th, 2020. Mr. Brosky, floor is yours. Good morning. How's everyone doing? I hope everyone's doing well. I just want to remind the board that after this meeting, we're going to disperse the room and then have an executive session uh, right after that. Just in looking at this agenda, it looks like a very light uh, agenda this month. Uh, we have we we are bringing back some awards and recognitions in the very beginning. You can see that there's five of them um, coming up to this board agenda, trying to balance both uh, the COVID situation and also a return to normalcy. You know, at the same time. Uh, number one is the minutes of the workshop and uh, discipline hearings, as well as the regular meeting on October first. Number two is the personnel consent agenda. Just the normal stuff there. There's no job um, descriptions or anything of that nature on there. Number three is a proclamation that uh, November 16th and 20th is National Education Week. And November 18th is Educational Sport Professional Days. We have both the celebration in the fall as well as the one in the spring, which is usually the first week of May. And number four is ac academic services, uh, out-of-state travel and overnight student travel. You can see that that is starting to pick up. You'll also notice that there's protocols that are attached mm -hmm. to all of those related to, to that particular issue of travel. I had a question about this one. Um, and Mr. Dale, maybe you can answer. Um, there's several wrestling teams that have traveled already or will be traveling in the month of October. Is there a special reason why they are coming to us so late? I, I can answer that, I think. Um, most of them, I believe, were are in, starting in November because wrestling isn't, isn't started, it hasn't started with the high school league. Would you look at the back of Because there I can several on there that are October. I'll double check on those, but some of the tournaments were last minute. Are we going to have them? Are we not? Um, and so they had to, the host school had to get approval from their area to actually host. So some of that is a little late coming just because determining if we're going to be able to host or not. I guess that's what I was thinking. Maybe they weren't doing it originally. Right. My other question is there's a cheerleading one on here, and they're going to have four girls to a room for overnight. Is that... Is there any kind of guidelines we're supposed to follow as far as that goes? We don't have guidelines as far as travel is concerned, but parents have to agree to that as okay. well and have to consent to that. And so the sponsor has to have meetings with parents to discuss the protocols. And then students are allowed to opt out without punishment if okay. they don't feel comfortable going. So is the school district released from any kind of liability if they, they should catch the COVID shoot? Right. Is it read in a room of four girls? Yes, ma'am. So it's because it's extracurricular. It has their COVID waivers and things as well. But they're allowed to opt out without punishment, and the parents have to basically be aware and approve of that travel. Very good. Thank you. And that's what I thought with the wrestling. I wasn't sure of it. It's been really good. We haven't been seeing things. Now, of course, we haven't been seeing things at all. But we have everything prior to COVID. You know, nothing had been coming late unless it was the end of the year and right. they made the playoffs or something like In that. In fact, I just, Mr. Reed just emailed me and said, hey, one of my, my uh, tournaments that I was attending just got canceled. Will you pull it? So mm -hmm. they're still. And some of these, what we're telling the sponsors is, Go ahead and submit your paperwork. I am telling them you better not put any money down, or if you do, right. you better be able to get it back because right now they're just putting the paperwork forward for approval. Mm -hmm. Then we can pull back if things are canceled. I think the cheer competition, she's not really sure, right. but she wanted to get approval first, and then we'll withdraw if we need and I, to. And I saw you had that written in the top corner of almost every one of them. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. 
thank you. Yes, ma'am. All right, number five is the addendum A to the dual enrollment agreement uh, with articulation agreement with UNF. Number six is the policies and procedures manual. This is the 1920 version. There was uh, an error in the attachments to the previous one. Uh, upon advice from, from council, we're starting the whole process over again for 1920. Because the attachments were incorrect. So we'll advertise this month and we'll bring it as a public hearing the following month, which is the normal procedure. There's nothing, uh, the revisions itself, there's a revisions page, looks like it's like five pages in. There's nothing dramatic as to the change. We just felt like we followed the proper procedure. When it was noticed, we went ahead and made that change. So we're up to number seven. Maxim Healthcare Service Contract, these are for nurses that we use. This is a standard contract that we have every year with, with them. Eight is the contract with the Children's Home Society with the data sharing agreement. As part of that whole process of community partnership schools, we have to share information with them. This is the contract that does that. The proposed allocation changes, you'll be glad to know that when you look at it, there's, a, there's actually a savings, um, maybe for the first time, rather than uh, a cost involved in that. It's basically shifting around as a result. There's no doubt that this year we'll have more shifting of individuals, both students and adults, than we've ever experienced in our entire uh, career in Clay County. parents reach out to me wanting to verify that once they finish out this um, fall semester that they can come back to school in the spring and yes. had some questions about what that process is going to Yes ma'am, on November 2nd we're going to release uh, information to parents as well as a survey to parents asking parents what they choose to do when it comes to the uh, second semester. Uh, we, we've got a steady influx of parents who have asked to come back to brick and mortar schools, of course, uh, one of the challenges is you might not have the teaching position to support that uh, because the current of our uh, positions are full. Have you had to turn anybody down at this point? Yeah, we do have some waiting lists at some schools and we've had to turn some people down and most people were able to uh, provide a little bit of relief knowing that uh, come spring if your choice is to come back to school that you can in fact do that. So there's no cap to the number of students that will be allowed to return in the spring? No, you I know. Mean, Things we're going to have to do is, is we're going to have to reshuffle allocations right. again in order yeah. to meet that. So well, with those that students have more money. money. Yes. That's what we want. Bring them back. So one of the things that we'll do is we'll put that survey out. We'll give parents two weeks to put it to give us their response, what they would like to do. That will provide us the time to not not only readdress where those allocations need to go, but also to inform employees and make sure that it's done properly. You know, in addition to that, you have Thanksgiving week as well as the Christmas holiday there. So it might seem like a lot of time, but not really when you start to realize the number of actual days that are involved there. And so that's the plan. How many forward. came back after this um, first quarter? Were they allowed? Like uh, the one play online were allowed to come back, right? Right. If we, if we had spots, we went ahead and allowed parents uh, the option of bringing students back. Uh, right now, we are at that point where uh, that's really not possible in many, many cases. And as a result, we're going to have to wait until uh, the second semester starts. And I, you know, I ask for parents' patience and understanding in the fact that uh, school systems don't move on a dime that way. There's uh, personnel involved. And so we've done our best. And, and really, the team has done a great job, Mr. Pickett. Mr. Daly, uh, Ms. Tito, Ms. Fogarty, Ms. Sanders, they've done a great job of, of really conversing with parents. You know they're very big on, on uh, customer service and providing quick customer service. Uh, that doesn't mean that everybody likes the answers that they get. We clarify that. Right? You know, we want to be responsive, and at the same time, we, there are some times we can't accommodate the situation. So, so how many? Do, do we have a number? Is it 500? Is it, uh, 
200, don't, 200? Don't, don't have a number. You know, we still have about, uh, I'm going to say, 23% of people that are still in some sort of online format, whether one play online or CDA. Uh, I do believe, just from the emails I receive and, and the word on the, on the street or the word <laughs> I heard, I, I think that you're going to get a huge influx of people back, so we want to prepare make sure that we have the staff to service them, and that's why it's done in a, in a more organized, uh, rational fashion. The conversations that I've had have all been, um, you know, we want to honor the system, but we really need that light at the end of the tunnel. Yeah. So they're yeah. wanting to come back, they're willing to we really just Do want we have an agreement with QCA regarding teachers coming back to the classroom? Right. I, think order? I think it's understanding that we're going to have to move student uh, teachers to where the students are. Okay. Uh, there's no agreement, no written agreement of that sort, but we we worked together on this issue already once or twice with this particular issue of moving staff in order to accommodate where the students wind up going, and that's you know we'll continue to do that. So parents look for November 2nd. That survey will be released, and you'll have a couple of weeks to make your decision. Then we'll take the information that you get, and just like the beginning, we'll move teachers and staff in order to accommodate the the options. So. If you could have staff put something together, I'd like to know how many have come back already. I'm just curious, so it's probably, you know, I'm sure it's some program you can run. Yeah, we'll see what the money report and come back. And see how many have come back. Okay, that brings us to number 10, uh, monthly financial reports for September. Number 11 is the, uh, the NSF write-off. <coughs> Permission. Let's see a couple of those there. Do we go through that by school? <laughs> or is it just happens to come up that way? It is based on um, a timeline, oh, okay. depending on what's uh, out there at each school. We do look at every school and make sure that they're attempting to collect. And then once that's we've gone through that grace period, then we'll bring it to the board to file. So there's no <laughs> Some of those are pretty old, so I think it's time. I know. Yeah. I know. We're trying to get them. There's some schools out there that still hold on to those things. We call those people. Okay, number 12, deletion of certain items for October. 13 is the uh, change order to Clay High Security Lighting Repair and Replacement. 14th, the change order for Orange Park High School HVAC repair replacement. I think that I would just call note to the fact that, I mean, it's for all that are listening, it's the cost to replace one air conditioning unit on the gymnasium at, at Orange Park High School is $953,000. Wow. I think that, that um, I know the first time that I looked at that, I kind of kind of gulped. I like, thought there was a mistake, right? Like, like oh my goodness, and, and I guess the point wow. is that those, they, they're expensive uh, to replace. I have an AC appointment this afternoon just for a cleanup. <laughs> I certainly <laughs> hope it doesn't go to $959. Number 59. <laughs> 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 Number 20, the change order for the Orange Park School District Office Renovation Remodel which is over there by food service and, and reshoring the restructuring that building's integrity over there. Is that the flooring on it? Or is that's, that's the upper floor of, of that particular building where um, food service is mm -hmm. and shoring that up. Uh, 16 is pre-qualifications of contractors. 17 is the uh, project priority list which would identify um, Lake Asbury Elementary onto that list, so this is for state approval. Number 18 is the school concurrency uh, proportionate share mitigation, which involves four student seats. Then on the discussion agenda, Human Resources Special Action, you can uh, read that um, pretty standard issue there, and D2's approval of the 2021-22-23 uh, through 22, 23 S&P map. 
for a public hearing. I told you it'd be quick. It's quick. Okay. Very good. Thank you. Thank you. And the, the, uh, any further comments, Mr. Brodsky? No, I, you know, I just appreciate everyone's continued patience as we, we ended the first nine weeks. Um, you know, I was, I was particularly concerned because anytime that a marking period ends, you know, parents tend to take solace at those uh, monumental time frames when each quarter ends. And sometimes when that occurs, they see how their students progressing and uh, they're either very happy Let's, let's, let's hope and pray that that's the case. They're very happy with how their student's doing. Or sometimes they, it's a check mark to say, my, my student needs to do more. And um, so I, I did expect to hear uh, a floodgate of people that uh, were concerned about their child. I've heard some, right? And uh, so I'm very, very proud of that fact. It, it shows that there's a little bit of flexibility in the system, a little bit of compassion by people and teachers out there when it comes to students, but at the end of the day, you know, uh, you know, the organization is developed for students to achieve academically. And so part of the return to normalcy is that there has to be a return to learning as we, as we knew it. And of course, it might not be from zero to 100, you know, it's not a light switch that's turned on in a pandemic. I get all of that. You know, a part of a return to normal is also a return to those kinds of routines in which learning is at the forefront, you know, for our students. And I'm, I'm proud of where we are as a district. Doesn't mean we can't improve. Certainly, there's plenty of areas to improve. But overall, I'm very proud of how the team is doing, and uh, both leaders at the school level, teachers in the classroom, our sports staff, everyone. So, um, I have nothing else to report. Okay. Mr. Bittner, any remarks from the attorney? No, nothing from me. Okay. School board member comments. Uh, I have a question. Chapman about substitutes. Are we improving that situation any? As far as getting them and people not having to cover classes? Some, but not to where, to be honest, not to where we would like to be. They, um, Kelly is putting out um, kind of like some informational and one of the things that she just sent me yesterday afternoon that they're doing in another district is they're having subs do like videos of their positive experience in a school. Mm -hmm. That she thought that she would reach out to some of our subs who are having positive experience in the schools and then they send that blast out. Um, Keystone is still having a very I'm difficult sure, time, sure hearing, so. but it's because there's been the outbreak at Keystone, and so the subs, they simply don't work out. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, the other thing is um, the letter we've received here, mm -hmm. um, uh, and I've seen a lot of comments about that. Um, I just, uh, I understand that we want to protect our district, but, um, um, you know, at the same time, I think we have to be careful uh, that we're overreaching sometimes. Because um, it'd be any diff not any different than a parent decided to throw a, a birthday party or any other kind of an event uh, that students would come to. Um, I know this weekend there will be a lot of trick or treating. Uh, in fact, several sanctioned by different organizations, and so there'll be a large number. I don't think we're going to send out a letter saying, you know, <laughs> well, gosh, we can't have any of these elementary schools attend and things like that. So I think we have to be a little careful of that. And the semantics of just making sure you don't use the name of the school because there is a Keystone Heights Junior Senior High School in Knox County, Pennsylvania. There's also a Clay High in Oregon. So um, there are other schools that have those same names. So semantics of just changing the name. Um, it's still that event, it's still you know, I just think we have to be careful, you know, really at that point in time it becomes a parent's responsibility and their personal responsibility. I, you know, again, we want to protect our district, but at the same time, by, you know, I mean, you'd have to be living under a rock to know that uh, we don't need to protect ourselves. So I just, uh, I have a little concern about the district, you know, um, starting to overreach. It's just like I, I used a, an example. I had a parent one time call me and say, had a boat bike stolen over the weekend, and my response was, "Did you call the police?" And they said, "Well, no, because I think it was a student." 
So, you know, and so they wanted me to reach out over and take care of that over the weekend. So I don't think, I think the reverse is also true. So I'm just making my point on that. Duly, duly noted. Okay. And of course, it's a, it's a fine line on, on this particular issue. I know it is. Um, you know, I, we see what happened in the news related to other sure. schools, in which other schools were, were in fact shut down for similar events. And so, uh, I think it's wise to caution people and certainly send a signal to parents that these are not sponsored. My, my big fear is that parents believe that uh, events were somehow sanctioned or sponsored by the district, and that is certainly not, not, not the case. Of course, the district does respect the right of parents and all citizens uh, of their own personal liberties and what they do outside of school, but, but let's all remember that we're all part of a team and what happens off of school grounds sure. could very well have an impact on what happens on school grounds and I think that's the point of kind of saying that events that um, that could lead to further transmission at schools you know we should avoid those events that's the recommendation of the health department of public health officials and I think I'd be remiss if we didn't remind people you know of that uh, and again well aware that our, our our jurisdiction ends at the at the school grounds, but at the same time, I think informing people is always the responsibility of the school district. And so I ha and like I say, I have no, but I did get a lot of calls, and a lot of people came to me and said, you know, they felt like you know it was their decision if their child went to Monaco and and that kind of thing. And I guess they, um, but anyway, I'm just pointing that. Out. Thank you. Okay, Ms. Bella, I'm just going to echo. Truly, it is their decision. However, when I was first learning about some of these activities and getting the letter and everything, I was like, whoa, we're trying to do whatever we can to keep COVID at bay. And, <laughs> and I'm glad that you did send the letter out, personally. And, but it was basically saying, look, it's your choice. And that's truly it. It's their choice. But I, other than that, I have nothing. Okay. Does Bill have that? Um, I'm just going to echo what Ms. Bullock said about the substitutes. I mm. talked to someone yesterday, Ridgeview High School had quite a few teachers out and they couldn't get subs. And uh, I haven't been on the dashboard to look, but um, how are our numbers here in Clay County? So last, last week, as far as adults go, we had five um, staff members test positive and 70 uh, people were quarantined right. that, were, that were staff right. as a result. 17 students total and 304 people quarantined. Right. And it's important to realize that the quarantine is a number of the previous week right. in addition to the current one. So there's some lag that goes with that data. Well, and we appreciate them being responsible and staying home if they've been exposed, so. Yes, ma'am. How many staff did you say are in quarantine? 70. Mm -hmm. Shouldn't say it that way because that those are individuals that are on uh, COVID-19 leave, which may or may not be quarantined, uh, uh, directed by the health department. Right. So, so it gets a little bit, um, a little bit trickier as far as data reporting. But they're out. We they're got out. The, we got the gist. And, and <laughs> finding yeah. subs, I know, yes. has been a challenge. Deep. And I, I just, I know this person was telling me at Ridgeview High. Everybody stepped up, guidance, administrators, everybody that could mm -hmm. cover a class did. And so I know, you know, our team is all working really hard. And uh, I'm just thank you. Yeah, you. you know, the substitute issue, you know, I'll just take that one head on. It's not going to be the same as in previous mm -hmm. years. We recognize that. When I look at the data when it comes to, to substitutes, uh, some of the uh, filling percentage for some schools is the same as if it was a normal year. Okay, it's almost like a, you know, a half are the same as last year and half mm -hmm. are not. Um, and it just really depends on the school. Mm -hmm. I've been at several schools where um, administrators, guidance, and other folks that aren't traditionally substituting in the classroom are, we're trying to avoid the splitting of students because then it takes students from one classroom, moves them into another, and that defeats the whole mitigation of the virus you know, situation, but I, I echo what you say, Ms. Carrick, is everybody seems to be stepping up, and it's going to be a challenge uh, 
even moving forward, and we'll continue to work on it. Well, it was impressive to the uh, the teacher that everybody did. It's like you know, they all got right in and helped. So. Well, I'll just uh, before I adjourn, I'll just say that you know we are in different times than we've ever been in uh, as far as dealing with COVID. Uh, everybody sitting here in this room wants our children and staff to stay as safe as possible. Um, just yesterday I learned um, of someone else who tested positive who is the spouse of one of our employees. It's out there and, I, and my fear is that we're going to relax <coughs> and not remember that it's still out there and we we must try to keep everyone safe you know the the things about the the dances and the letters and so forth you know from the liability uh, end of it I haven't talked to Mr. Bickner about it but you know we need to we needed a letter to clarify that the district this is not sanctioned by the district and I understand parents wanting some sort of celebration for their children, but it's their responsibility because we cannot take on that responsibility. And and one reason that I absolutely love Clay County School District is because of things like you just talked about. We pull together. When we are lacking in something, uh, everybody will step in and pull together and work together as a team. And that's what makes Clay County School District so special. And uh, we are a family. And with that, I will adjourn the 28-27 uh, minute uh -huh. agenda review. <laughs> <laughs>